Welcome to Upstate Church Anderson. Uh, my name is Will. I'm the teaching pastor here. I'm so excited that out of all the places you could be this morning, uh, that you chose to be here with our church family, and we're so thankful for that. If you're our guest, maybe this is even your first time here, we'd love the chance to connect with you. Uh, I'll be out front after the service. You can fill out a connect card. We would love uh, the chance just to get to know you uh, if this is your first time, or uh, if you're still just kind of checking us out after church, we'd love the opportunity uh, to get to know you after the service. If you've been here the last few weeks, then you know that we've been walking through the book of Revelation. We actually have seven weeks left in this series. We'll go through now all the way through Easter Sunday. And this is an awesome opportunity for you to invite friends, maybe people who you know, who you think might would be interested. Um, Revelation, the, you know, the end times, what's going to happen at the end of the world. Things like that are just interesting to people. People have a lot of questions about that. So this is a really awesome opportunity for you to invite friends, for you to bring people with you uh, to church on Sunday morning. But I just want to issue a challenge uh, to those of you who are here today. Man, don't miss a Sunday in between now and Easter. Let's really dig in together as we dig into God's word uh, through the book of Revelation. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've been focusing on the way in which Revelation shows us who Jesus is. That's what the word revelation really means. It's an unveiling. In a lot of ways, it's kind of a backstage view or a behind the scenes view of both the end times and into the person of Jesus. We realize that these are things, you know, the end of the world and even who God is, these are things that can be confusing, maybe even scary, can maybe bring us some fear. And so what God wants to do through his word during our time together, both this morning and the rest of our series, is God wants to replace whatever fear or confusion you might have with faith. God wants to unveil for you, make clear to you what might not be clear as of right now. It doesn't mean we're gonna have every question answered. It doesn't mean we're gonna know every detail about the end times or about who Jesus is. But I, I believe if we'll dig into scripture together, uh, then we will get to see him. If we have eyes to see, we'll get to see him a little clearer than we do today. Uh, so this morning, we're going to move kind of specifically into looking at the way in which God is sovereign. And not only sovereign, not only in control generally, but this morning we'll focus specifically on the way in which God is sovereign over judgment. That we'll look this morning at the way in which God is in control over ju the judgment of all things. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn uh, to Revelation chapter 6. I'll meet you there here in just a moment. Revelation chapter 6. Last week, we looked at this vision from the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 5, where we saw a scroll, the scroll that represents God's judgment, his plan for salvation and redemption. Uh, and there was no one in all of heaven and all of earth who was worthy to open the scroll until John's vision is turned to Jesus, to the lamb who was slain. And we see this picture in Revelation 5 of Jesus as the one who is worthy and the one who is able to open up the scroll, the one who is worthy and able uh, to enact God's plan of salvation and redemption and judgment in the world. What we'll see this morning in Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 6 and chapter 7 is we will actually see Jesus opening up that scroll, breaking the seals of that scroll, and actually enacting God's plan of judgment and redemption this morning. The truth is that no one really likes talking about judgment. Like none of you guys on your ride over here this morning were thinking to yourself like, man, I really hope we're talking about God's wrath this morning. Like that'd be, that'd be so fun. Like, yeah, good morning. Welcome to church. You're a sinner. God's going to judge you, right? Like that's, that's not exactly like the most exciting thing for us to talk about. But I believe if we'll actually read the Bible for what it's worth this morning, if we'll actually have eyes to see what God's trying to show us this morning, that we'll see this. If you truly trust God, then you must believe that even his judgment is good. That's what we're going to see this morning. That if you really believe God is good, then you have to believe that even his judgment is good. That God is not only good insofar as we agree with what he's doing. 
God's not only good as, as long as he does things that we like or that feel good to us. No, if we believe that God is good, if we truly trust God, then even his judgment is good. Hebrews 12, 6 says, the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Job 5, 18 says, for he wounds, but he binds up. He shatters, but his hands heal. This morning, I believe we will see that even God's judgment is good. And so before we get into our text, I'll start by saying the first thing that I want us to see this morning is that God holds history in his hands. That God is the one who holds all of history in his hands. Let's jump in and read in Revelation chapter 6 and we'll start in verse 1. John says, now I watched when the lamb opened one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, come. And I looked and, and behold a white horse and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he came out conquering and to conquer. When he had opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal and I heard the third living creature say, come, and I looked and behold a black horse and its rider had a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. And I looked and behold a pale horse and its rider's name was death and hell followed with it. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. I understand that when we look at a passage like this, there's a lot of symbolism involved. There, there's a lot of pictures that we might say, man, what is this trying to say? Uh, we might even begin with the question, when is all of this going to happen? Is this something that's already happened maybe in the time of John? Is this something that is happening right now in our midst? Or is this something that only is gonna happen at the second coming of Christ or at the end of the world? And I understand there are a ton of questions here. The reason reality is this is a passage that's been interpreted a lot of different ways by a lot of people who are godly and a lot smarter than me. And rather than trying to get into the weeds and, and make some kind of statement on each individual symbol here or, or even on a timeline of this, what we're going to try to do throughout our entire series in Revelation is major on what is clear. We're going to try to focus in on what God has made clear in his word. And that way we can actually see Jesus for who he really is. The, the main point of this passage of scripture isn't a timeline of the end of the world. The main point of this passage of scripture is for us to get a clear picture of who Jesus is. So here's what we can say for sure. Uh, we can say for sure that the events that are depicted in this passage are real events that are really happening. That, this, is, this is not referencing just an idea. These are real events. The things that are referenced here, whether symbolic or literal, they're referencing things that actually happen. And I don't even really have to explain much for you to get that. We know that war is a part of our world. We know that's something that's happened in the past. We know it's happening now. We know that it'll happen in the future. And so when one of these writers, when one of them is death, when part of God's judgment is death, we don't have to wonder, well, is that happening right now? We, we know that death is a part of our human experience. We know that it's something that'll continue to happen into the future. War, disease, famine, economic collapse, all of the things that are described here. We know that these happen in the world in the time of John. We know they happen today and, and we know that they will happen into the future. And so the best thing that we can do this morning is try to get a clear picture of who Jesus is and what this text is trying to teach us about him. And what we see here about Jesus is incredibly clear. What we see here about Jesus is that he is completely in control. 
that no matter how confusing or, or how scary or how obscure the end of the world might feel to us, no matter how little we might want to talk about God's judgment, that what we see that's being played out in this passage of scripture here, the judgment of God, what we see is that Jesus is completely in control that he's in control of world events, that he is in control of the judgment of the world. The writers each represent a, a different mode of God's judgment, that God is allowing these terrible things into the world as a result of our sin. I don't know if you guys felt how, how wild this is, but uh, John gives each of the riders of the horse a name, and one of the riders comes in on a pale horse, which is already kind of creepy, right? Like already, I don't even know what that means. But then John says his name is death. That's kind of scary. Like that's, like like that's kind of how you'd write it in like a scary movie. His name is death. And if that wasn't enough, hell follows after him. It's like, okay, this is some serious stuff going on. Like this, this is actually like judgment is not just like a walk in the park. This isn't just like a, a, a story that we would tell ourselves at night. Like this is terrible. The judgment that's being talked about here, famine and disease and war, I mean, no wonder that people think that Revelation is confusing. No wonder that some people think the end of the world might be scary. But did you catch what preceded each of the horses, what preceded each of the, of the acts and modes of judgment? Before each horse, each act of judgment is let loose on the world, Jesus has to open up the seal. That even in judgment, even over the terrible things that exist in this world, even over death itself, that God is still in control. That God does not, that God has in, in complete and total control over all of judgment. That judgment isn't catching God by surprise. That, that the things that, that might weigh us down, the things that might confuse us, that might scare us, that they are not catching God by surprise, but that God is completely and totally in control. And if we're not careful, we might look at this, we might, we might wrestle with that reality, and it might lead us to say, well, is it God who's doing all of these things to us? You might have experienced some pain and difficulty, even death of a loved one in your life, and you might have, your, your natural reaction might have been to blame God. You're like, I believe God's in control. I believe that God's sovereign over everything that happens. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking this must be his fault. How can we balance a picture that God is completely in control and not believe that when we go through something, when we experience judgment like this, when we experience the consequences of our sin like this, that it's not God's fault? How, how can we believe that? All of history is dark and ugly. There is, there is every day a new thing for you to believe it might be God's fault. Every day you experience something that reminds you of your brokenness, of the fallenness of humanity, of how broken and messed up our world is. But God's sovereignty does not mean that he is committing all of this evil. God's sovereignty means that he can use all of that evil for his glory and for your good. God's sovereignty means that there is nothing that God cannot redeem, that there is nothing that God does not see and God cannot have authority over. The reality of what's happening in this passage of scripture is this, that God is allowing humanity to experience the consequences of our sin. That the evil we experience in the world, the brokenness that we experience in the world, the loss that you and I experience in our lives, they're not God dropping the hammer on us. It's God allowing us to experience the consequences of our own sin. Not only individually, but also in all of humanity. That you and I have messed up. We are broken. We have sinned against God. And sin has consequences. And so what we see in this passage of scripture is all of humanity experiencing the end of our sin. 
God's judgment is not a vengeful and hateful God dropping the hammer on a humanity in which he's, to which he's angry. God, God isn't punishing us for our sin because he doesn't like us. God is allowing us to experience the consequences of our sin because he loves us. God's intention in allowing the seven seals to be broken, God's intention in allowing his wrath and judgment, the consequences of our sin to be experienced, God's purpose in that is to cause you to turn from the sin that's leading to judgment and turn to a a savior who leads to redemption. God's purpose is, It's for his judgment to cause you to turn back, to turn away from sin and to turn to him. Even in the midst of all of this darkness, God is in control. I love the way in which, I love the way that our uh, campus pastor at Haywood Dallas Wilson said this. Why does God allow this evil, this brokenness to run loose on the earth? Why is he allowing judgment like this? Because in experiencing evil and brokenness, we turn to the righteous and whole Savior who can make us righteous and whole. That judgment is meant to turn us back to God. God allows pain and suffering to show us where our sin leads. God's judgment, even this picture of judgment that we're getting to dig into today together, it is meant to be a warning sign on the road that God is saying, don't keep going that way. The road runs out that way. Death is that way. Sin leads unto death. Death is that way. The road runs out that way. Don't keep going that direction. Turn from your sin and yourself and turn to Jesus. That's what God's judgment is meant to do for us. God wants to make us uncomfortable in our sin and our complacency. And if God's judgment is required to dislodge us, then that's what he'll do to save us from ourselves, to save us from our sins. So this passage teaches us that God holds history in his hands. But secondly, I want you to see, it shows us that there are only two responses. When we are faced with judgment like that, with wrath like that, consequences to our sin like that, we have to step back and recognize that there are really only two ways that we can respond. Everyone has to decide which of those sides they are on. You have to decide whether you will run to God or whether you will run from God. That's what we're about to see as we continue to read in Revelation chapter six. There are two ways to respond to the reality of God's judgment. Either we run to our heavenly father or we run away from him in shame. Let's pick back up in verse nine. When Jesus opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness that they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake And the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great one and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? When we see terrible judgment like this, wrath like that, there are only two responses. The martyrs, those who have have sacrificed their lives for the sake of the gospel, they issued the first response in this text. These believers say, how long, O Lord? 
a desire for God's justice, that's the first way that we can respond to judgment. God's people see the reality of his judgment and they have a heart that cries for justice. God's people see God's judgment and our hearts cry for justice, cry out, how long, O Lord? This first response is a desire for God to make things right, for God to set things in their right place. The reality is that the human heart naturally cries for justice. When you feel like you've been wronged, when you've been mistreated, a desire for justice naturally wells up inside of you. Sometimes it's the feeling in your chest like your heart is gonna explode. Sometimes it's the feeling of all the blood in your body rushing to your face. Sometimes it's tears falling from your eyes as you see hatred or death or pain or tragedy on your timeline or in the news. Sometimes it's holding the hand of a friend who's lost someone and your heart cries out, how long, O oh Lord? How long are things gonna be broken? How long am I gonna have to experience this pain? How long are things going to continue to unravel? How long, O oh Lord, until you set things right? The Christian cry to God's judgment is not to run away. It's to run to God. It's to say, God, we want to see your justice come. We want to see you making things right. We want to see you setting things right. We want to see you redeeming things. I want to turn to what might at first seem like an odd place. If you take notes, you can even just kind of jot this reference down. But the book of Habakkuk is, is really exactly where these words come from. There's a really clear echo in, in this text to the words of the prophet Habakkuk. And he's actually really the only minor prophet who he's not talking from God to other people. He's actually having a conversation with God. Look at what he says in verse two of chapter one. He says, oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? I mean, this is, the, this is the voice of the martyrs in Revelation chapter 6, right here in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2. But look at how God responds in chapter 2, verse 3. God says, if it seems slow, wait for it. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. But the righteous shall live by faith. A few thoughts here before we move on to the second response. First, if you have been wronged, if life seems broken, if you look around at the world and you can't help but say, how long am I gonna cry out to you, God? How long are things gonna be like this? How long will I feel broken? How long will I have to experience this pain? If that's how you feel this morning, God is saying, if it seems slow, wait for it. God will not delay, that God will be making all things right. God will redeem what is broken. God will set things in their right place. You can wait on him. You can wait patiently. You can trust that he's going to set things right. The second thing that I want us to see before we move on is that God saves through his judgment. And I would say, I just challenge you, if you want some reading beyond our reading plan this week, that Habakkuk would be a great book for you to read through and learn more about this. But God saves through his judgment. Think about the cross. God's greatest act of salvation was in pouring out his wrath and judgment on his only son. That the way in which God saves the world is always through judgment. That redemption must come through wrath. It must come through the punishment of sin. And so if we as believers look negatively on the judgment of God, we are also looking negatively on the redemption of God. That God punishing sin is the only way that God can eradicate sin from the world. God judging sin is the only way that he can set things right. That God redeems through his judgment. 
The third thing I want you to see is that it would be unjust for God to judge the righteous and the unrighteous together. It would be unjust for God to judge and pour his judgment out on the righteous and the unrighteous together. And here's where our choice is. Habakkuk says the righteous shall live by faith. You can place your faith in Jesus and have your faith counted unto you as righteousness because of the work of Jesus on the cross, not because you're good enough, not because you've earned it, not because I can make my own way to God, but simply because I've placed my faith in Jesus, that I walk by faith, that the Bible says my faith can be counted unto me as righteousness, that you can be judged not according to your works, not according to your mess, but according to the work that Jesus did for you on the cross. That's one option. Or the other option is to be judged by our works, to be judged for what we have done. And guys, I don't know about you, but that's a scary proposition for me. That's a, that's a terrifying idea to me, that I might be judged for all of eternity based on whether or not I had it right whether or not I lived the way that I was supposed to live. The truth is, guys, you know this and I know this. We haven't. I know that I couldn't measure up. I know that I couldn't possibly have enough righteousness in myself to be judged worthy of eternity with God. It's a terrifying proposition to be judged by your works. The only way to be judged in any other way it's to place your faith in Jesus and have that faith counted to you as the righteousness of God. God's judgment does not have to be a scary idea for you if you are covered by the blood of Jesus. God's judgment, his wrath, it doesn't have to be something you want to avoid. It doesn't have to be something you hate if you are covered by the blood of Jesus. But if you are not, if instead you run away from Jesus, then you will respond in the same exact way that these men and women did in our passage of scripture. They run and hide their face from God because in their own righteousness, they know that judgment is coming for them. The unrighteous will be judged for the works that they have done. Those who are not covered by their faith in Jesus, they will experience eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Our options, our choice is to either run to Jesus now or run from Jesus for all of eternity. Run into the arms that are open for you or run and hide in shame away from a God who will punish sin, who will set things in their right place. That's the choice that you and I have to make. I want you to hear this this morning before we move on. This second option, this second choice, this second response, this response of running and hiding from God, it's what sin has been doing to us from the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sin against God, and their immediate reaction is shame. They run and they hide their face from God. And, and the rulers and, and the rich and powerful, and the Bible says even the slave and the free, that everyone who is marked by their sin, here at the end of time, in this vision that John has, they act towards sin the same exact way that Adam and Eve responded to the very first sin. They run and hide from God. In shame, they hide their face from the only one who can save them from their sin. And I want you to hear this this morning. You don't have to run away from God in shame. That doesn't have to be your story. God is not pushing you away because of your sin. God is not repulsed by you because you've messed up. God isn't kicking you to the curb because you're broken. Actually, it's exactly the opposite. The scriptures tell us that God is near to the brokenhearted. Jesus said, I came not for the well, but for the sick, that he's a physician, he's a doctor who came to heal what's been broken. And so if you feel broken this morning, Jesus said he came for you, that he wants to draw near to you that his arms are open to you. You don't have to run and hide in shame because of your sin. 
If you will turn from your sin, turn from yourself, and run to your Savior in faith this morning, his arms are open to you. Your shame and fear can be replaced by the love and grace of your heavenly Father this morning. So we see in this text that God holds history in his hands, that the reality of God's judgment forces us into two possible responses, to run towards God or to run away from him. But lastly, I want you to see that God is redeeming his own for eternity. That this is what God is doing in judgment. That in death, in, in pestilence or disease, in famine, in economic collapse, in the brokenness of our world, even at the end of all things, that what God's purpose is, is to redeem his own for eternity. You may look at your life and say, what's God trying to do in my life? What's God's purpose for my life? God's purpose is always twofold, his glory and your redemption. That's what God's doing in the world. So even in judgment that seems terrible like this, God is seeking out his glory and your redemption. Chapter six ends with a question. Reality of all of that judgment, who can stand? Who can stand in the midst of all that judgment? Chapter seven is the answer. Let's flip over to chapter seven. We'll finish our time together there this morning. I'm not gonna read the first eight verses. Some of you are probably pretty familiar with this part of the passage. It mentions this crowd, this group of 144,000 people uh, that are around the throne. There, again, there are a lot of different interpretations. People fall all on the spectrum of ideas of who this group is or what they represent. Uh, the word, if you highlight or underline that I will focus on is the word sealed. You'll see that three or four times in that, in that part of our passage. And we'll come back to that here in just a second. That's really the emphasis here in this part. But we're going to read, finish up our reading starting in verse 9. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, amen. Blessing and honor and wisdom and thanksgiving and, and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? And I said to him, sir, you know. He's like, you're the one who's supposed to know this. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more neither shall they thirst. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Quickly, let's talk about the 144,000. What do these represent? Regardless of what you believe about this, this word sealed is where we'll focus. That what God is intending to do here is to bring our attention to the way in which God has sealed and secured the salvation of all those who are in his family from before the foundation of the world. Again, if you take notes, Ephesians 1, 4, uh, it says this, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that if we are redeemed by God, that if we are a part of God's family, that we are sealed and secured even before all things. That's what's happening in this passage of scripture. That if you have a relationship with Jesus, that means that God chose you and sealed you. That all of God's people, past, present, and future are secure in him. Not in our works, not in our worthiness, but in him. 
But then John draws our attention in another vision to this great multitude, to a crowd so great that no one can number. And, and while this 144,000 is before anything, before all things, this great multitude has already passed through all of the trouble and pain and suffering and sin and tribulation. So that if this first vision of the 144,000 is meant to point us to before the beginning, that this great multitude is meant to point us to the end of all things. And so as we close, three realities that I want you to see from these two visions. First, that God has sealed you from beginning to end. That if you are in Christ, that you, your salvation is as secure as he is that he has sealed you, that he has made you his from beginning to end if you place your faith in him, if you have a relationship with him, that you are as secure as he is. Secondly, that this great multitude from every tribe and tongue and language, that this multitude is a fulfillment of the great commission. That when Jesus said that our mission as believers is to go and take the gospel to all nations, to make disciples of all peoples, that this vision is a fulfillment, it's a made reality of that mission. Here's what that means, that if you are a Christian in this room, if making disciples is the mission of your life in this room, we already know how the story ends. We know that the gospel will get to all nations. We know that salvation will come to all peoples. We know how the story ends. So here's what that means for us. We have to decide if we wanna be a part of it. You have to decide. If you want to make it the mission of your life to connect people with Jesus or not, God's mission will come to pass. His purposes will come to pass. You have to decide if you want to be a part of it. What a beautiful day that will be to stand before the throne of God with people from every nation, tribe, and tongue worshiping the God whose mission will be fulfilled. The third and final thing I want you to see is this, that eternity will be glorious because God will be there. What sheltering this multitude for eternity? It's the presence of God. That you and I will not suffer, we will not sin, we will not thirst or hunger for righteousness or salvation anymore because the shepherd will be in our midst because the lamb who was slain will be our God and we will be his people for all of eternity. Eternity is sweet because God will be there and we will be his. God's judgment as terrible and scary as it might seem to us is beautiful because the ultimate reality of God's judgment is that we will spend eternity in perfection in delight with him. That can be your future. That can be the reality of your eternity. But if you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, then God's judgment is a terrible reality for you. That is a choice that you can make this morning. So whether it's coming up to me after our service, filling out a connect card, I'd love to have a conversation with you about how you can make that eternal reality, your present reality this morning. But if you're here today and you know you have a relationship with Jesus, but the truth is that you needed to be reminded that God is the one who's in control, that God's the one who is sovereign. Maybe you needed to be reminded to stop running away from God in shame and run to Jesus today regardless of how you need to respond, my prayer, my challenge for you this morning, that you'd say yes to Jesus, that you'd run to him. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that we can run to a savior who loves us. We believe today that your judgment is ultimately our salvation for those of us who are in you. We know that you discipline the ones who you love. And so we cry out with all of creation, with the saints who have gone before us, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Set things right. Redeem 
broken creation, redeemed broken creatures like us. God, we want you. We run to you this morning. Accept us as your children into your open arms. Heal what's been broken. Bind up our wounds. Draw us deeper into relationship with you. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.